Hello, I'm Jane and this is my channel where I share lots of content about home recording, especially aimed at beginners. This video is all about how to record violin. Now, given that the coolest shop on the planet is the Electric Violin Shop in North Carolina, in my opinion, and that their YouTube channel is one of my absolute favourites, packed with content about electric violins, obviously, but also recording violin. Who am I going to talk to if I want to know more about how to record called violin for musicians who may be new to all this stuff. Obviously it's going to be Matt Bell. He is a fantastic violinist, he's also an audio engineer and he is content creator in chief for the Electric Violin Shop. So I've learned so much already watching his excellent videos. They are entertaining and really informative and if you are interested in this subject then you should definitely go and check them out. But what I wanted to do was go back to the start and try and get a bit of a roadmap on how to record your violin. Now I post regular videos on home recording so if that sounds like something you're interested in then please do subscribe and if you enjoy this video give it a like that really helps me out. So let's go and meet Matt. Hi everyone today I am delighted to welcome Matt Bell to my channel. Hi Matt. Howdy. Howdy. Awesome. I All love right. your room. That's amazing. Oh, thank you. Yeah. My turn. Now, your Facebook page says you play violin loudly if possible. Does that just I try. <laughs> and also you are the cool dude who makes videos for the electric violin shop. I don't know about the adjective, but I am the guy that makes the videos for the electric violin shop. Absolutely. Yep. Hundreds, hundreds of videos there are now. So much brilliant content on all things violin, mostly electric, but quite a bit how to record your acoustic violin. Yeah, good times. I've been doing this for uh, 20 some years and I just figured it would be a lot of fun to maybe help people learn more quickly the things that I had to learn the hard way. Yeah, yeah. Well, definitely. I mean, all your videos, they're, they're entertaining and you're a very good educator as well. And you're not in your normal, normal with the wall of violins behind you sort of <laughs> set up there. No, I'm in the middle of a ski vacation right now, but uh, it's, you know, you can't go skiing too early in the morning. So I figured I'd wake up and chat with you guys and then, uh, and then I'll go try to break some bones later on. Brilliant. It's sad in Britain, we've got like the best snow they've had in Scotland for, for, for years and no one's allowed to go. Oh, yeah. It, there's a lot of restrictions here. A lot of restrictions. There's not hardly anybody here. Uh, the last really? time I was here, it was jam packed full of people before the, uh, before the coronavirus but uh, it's kind of nice for me that there's just not a lot of people around you, you so basically to... ski right up to the lift and go. Yeah. Now, so you know everything there is to know about <laughs> recording violins, um, but there's just so much content there that, you know, where do, if someone walked into the store and said, I play acoustic violin and I fancy videoing myself or recording myself, where would you start? What would you advise them to start with? Yeah, so the way we usually start, and, and the cool thing about the, the the world of electronics is there's generally a very, very simple way to start, and then we can start adding complexity. A lot of these things are modular. You don't have to go buy a million-dollar studio in order to start recording. No. You can start with your cell phone, and generally, that's where a lot of people start. They say, well, I've got a cell phone already. It's got a 4K camera in it. It's got a pretty decent mic in it. I mean, I can go buy a tripod for $5 and I can start. And that's a great way to start. It really is. It's a great way to start. And generally, as you start filming yourself, you're going to learn two things. You're going to learn that, hey, I could be a better player. Yeah, and you're I'm also going to learn that, hey, I could be a better recordist. So you're going to, you're sort of those two things are going to, are going to go at the same time. And even with, I would say a little crappy cell phone video, but there's, there's not anything, there's not any such thing as a crappy cell phone video compared to what was available for professionals 30 years ago. This is infinitely better than what the professionals had. It's true. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, start with your cell phone on a tripod and, and, and learn from it what you can learn from it. You're going to hear a lot of things. You're going to hear articulations and, and maybe the tone um, isn't, you know, your cell phone mic isn't going to capture all the nuances of your tone. And you're going to go, okay, well, gosh, I sure wish I could record my tone better, but learn what you can learn from the product that you have. And then maybe say, well, maybe I want to upgrade 
my microphone and you can get a better microphone for your cell phone or maybe I want to upgrade my lighting or maybe I want to upgrade the sound treatment of the room that I'm in. Yeah. And then you sort of start going down this rabbit hole. There is a massive rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But I would say it, the very first 99.9% of people have a cell phone. Don't use the excuse that I don't have $10,000 worth of gear to not record yourself and learn what you can learn, even with a cell phone video. That is brilliant advice, yeah, because you can hear if you're in tune or can hear stuff when you listen back to yourself that you just yeah, don't hear. Yeah, crossings play. are bad or, or whatever. Yeah, or my timing is off, um, you know, all those things. You record yourself. And the question is, am I interested in being a better player or am I interested in being a content producer? And, and hope maybe both, but hopefully the first for sure, everybody wants to be a better player. So if you're not interested in being a content creator, you're not trying to put professionally produced videos out on the web for people to see, my goodness, who cares if the if it's pointing at your ceiling fan too much or <laughs> yeah. who cares? I mean, let's, let's be a better player first. That's true. But then what I found in my journey of trying to record myself and everything is that it the violin is not an easy instrument to record. It is not. It kind of, you no. sound a little bit like the MIDI strings in the old general MIDI thing a bit. Mm. And you think, God, am I really that bad? You know, I can, I, yes, it can, ha it's obviously a brilliant learning aid, but you sort of, it would be nice to get to the next stage where you thought, oh yeah, I'm, I'm quite proud of the way that sounds now, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. I will so, say um, that I've got some videos that I shot with my cell phone of Rachel Barton Pine playing in her living room. I've been fortunate enough to be at her house in Chicago and, and uh, she sounds fantastic through a cell phone camera. Wow. <laughs> Which tells me that when I don't sound fantastic, it ain't the camera. Okay. Okay. Uh, That's a good so, point. I, you know, again, it's the, a good player is going to sound good through nearly any mic. It's true. Now, that being said, is Rachel Barton Pine going to publish cell phone videos of herself? Probably not. No. Um, she has the option to to use good mics and good rooms and good recorders. So I think where your head like is, okay, I, I want myself to sound as good as possible. And I think step one is we got to figure out exactly where we want to hear the violin from, right? Because the violin underneath your ear sounds one way and the violin from six feet away sounds a different way right? You know, under your ear, you can hear all the bow noise. You're hearing the, the thump of the changing of directions of your bow. You're hearing the scratch of the strings. And if you close mic the violin, you're hearing like your fingers coming out. You know, we're, violins are noisy. A lot of those noises are so small and they're so weak that they don't push through the air. And the audience in a concert hall doesn't hear those things right? They don't hear the little scratch of your bow hair. But if you put a mic right next to the violin, it is going to hear that stuff. So, well, okay, let's put a microphone out in a room. Well, the problem in that case is now you're going to hear not just the violin, but you're going to hear the room. And unless you've got a, uh, you know, a Guarneri del Jesu, you may not be filling this room with this massive sound. And how many of us have access to Carnegie Hall? To record ourselves. We don't necessarily, we're not going to sound like we're in the Sistine Chapel because we're not in the Sistine Chapel. This is true. Yes. So close miking has advantages of being able to hear all the nuances of your sound. Distance miking has the advantages of allowing that sound to bloom properly. But then now the, the, the shortcomings of your room are exposed. So I, my best sound, I think when I've recorded has been sort of an intermediate space. So instead of having the mic 30 or 40, 50 feet away, which is where that sound has a chance to bloom. You get the acoustics of the room that you're in. I don't have a room that sounds great from 50 feet away. Um, I don't have a room that's 50 feet. If you've seen my videos, you know, my <laughs> closet that I record in, it's literally a closet. So I, I can, I can maybe put a mic four to six feet away. Yeah. And then I have done a lot of work. If you see those videos to deaden that room down so that I don't have, I don't have a room that actually sounds like something. I try to make that room sound like nothing. Okay. And then I can add in that room sound later on. So basically I just need a nice clean recording of my violin that captures as many of the nuances as I can from a close mic standpoint, but allows some of the air in the room to filter out 
some of the scratch and, you know, it does allow that sound to bloom out of the instrument. So. Okay. Now you made um, one of the videos I've, I've watched a couple of times is one where you've kind, you kind of work through a whole series of pickups and close mics. And, um, and that's really interesting because you can hear the progression from sort of spending hundred dollars on a, a little right. pickup to, uh, all the way through up to these sort of mics you can put on. So it's quite good. And I noticed that what you did there was, well, what sounded really nice is when you, you used a G-Track, mm -hmm. a G-Track, which is like, um, ah, yeah. It's cool. What I'm talking about right now. Oh, <laughs> oh God, right, okay. <laughs> so that's like a that's like a combination. It's got it's a USB mic, but it's also got in a built-in interface that so you can plug the mic, uh, the guitar, uh, we're not talking about guitars here, um, violin. violin. Guitars are silly instruments, yeah, that's right. Violin straight in. <laughs> And you can hear one or the other, or you can kind of blend it. And it was quite nice when you blended it, actually. It was quite, I thought it was a really good piece of kit for that, actually. Yeah, it's a great little mic. And actually, I was turned on to this uh, by my buddy, Matt Vanacoro. Um, and I have a podcast called the Rockstar Violinist Podcast. And we have interviewed um, 56 or 57 players. And each episode is kind of like a... Uh, it's like a commercial for that player. It's really, it's a deep dive into, you know, what is your life and what is your music and what is your art and what's your inspiration? What's your history. And we've, of those 50 some players, we've interviewed two people that are not players that are not uh, violinists or cellists or violists. Okay. Um, one was Ned Steinberger who invented the Steinberger um, guitars and also the NS design uh, orchestral suite. They've got violins, violas, cellos, basses, and he's a, he's he's a brilliant man. His dad has a, a Nobel Prize in physics, and I think Ned probably learned more about science at the kitchen table than most PhDs well, ever learned in their lives. <laughs> so we interviewed Ned because he's a, a designer of fantastic instruments. And then the other guy that we interviewed, who's not a violinist, is Matt Vanicoro. And Matt is a music teacher and a studio engineer. And he is one of Mark Wood's uh, recording engineers. He's Mark Wood's keyboard player. Uh, he's also my mixing engineer. He works with Joe Denison and Stratospherius. He works with uh, Earl Manian and Resolution 15 and all these fantastic electric violinists. But he's recorded a lot of violinists too. And, and if you really want sort of a deep dive into equipment, uh, the interview that I did with Matt Vanacoro for the Rockstar Violinist podcast is is like getting a degree in recording violin. Uh, and he's been doing this for years and years and just does a fantastic job of breaking down what does a violinist need to record. Anyway, all that to say, he writes for Ask Audio Magazine. He turned me on to the Samson G-Track. Oh, right. And said okay. that um, for the money... It's just, it's a fantastic little piece of gear. I mean, he's got Neumann mics that are worth thousands of dollars in his mic closet, but he also has one of these. He says, if I'm going to go on vacation and I might do a Zoom interview with some fantastic artist in, in the UK, um, maybe you'd bring the Samson G-Track with you because <laughs> it fits in your suitcase. And it's just a super handy little piece of gear. Um, okay. And it sounds great for yeah, it does. 100 and some hundred and some dollars. I don't remember exactly what it cost, but I think less than 200 bucks. Yeah. Interesting. So the, one of the things you were doing on that video is you were, um, when you get this dry, if you're using a pickup and you use this dry signal, it do, it sounds, it's a bit of a weird sound, isn't it? <laughs> Um, it, I mean, it's, it's a little close. Yeah. yeah. And so you, um, so you were adding a bit of reverb onto it and I wondered mm -hmm. where you were doing that because I, I, I don't, were you live streaming that video? Yeah. Yeah, sure. It was. So there are, there are options. Right. And basically in your, there's always options. Um, my, my degree is not in music. My degree is in engineering. I and chose. the first thing they teach you in engineering school is, uh, that the answer to every question is it depends. Right. Okay. So we never answer questions. Um, it's two plus two, four. Well, it depends. Um, so generally my signal path will be instrument. And if I'm using a, uh, a, a passive pickup, then I'm going to go instrument into a preamp and then I can do any of the processing that I want. And then I can send that out to the world, whether it be through an amplifier or direct into an interface or whatever. In that particular case, I was going into a, uh, a, I think I was using a Boss ME80 
effects pedal. Okay. And, and then, then out. out of the Boss ME80, I was actually going into an amplifier in the room. Ah, okay. Um, but then, so the Boss ME80 has a, has a uh, stereo output. So I can plug the violin in and it can do all the processing that it does. And then it has a left and a right output. And I will send one of those outputs directly to my Samson G-Track. Yeah. The other output goes to an amplifier in the room. Oh. The amplifier in the room is really for me. is so I can hear what the instrument sounds like. Because if I just send it to the G-Track, I don't know, like, is this thing drowning in reverb? Is it cracking and popping? Is there something crazy going that might be going out to the world? And I have no idea because I'm not hearing the amplified sound at all. No, that's brilliant. Yeah, I wondered how you were doing it. So yeah, I just split it with an ME80. Right, so that would work for doing live streams. Mm -hmm. And it would also work if you wanted to record a sort of signal from the violin with a bit of reverb already on it to, into your recording software. Yeah. And the thing is, when you're when you're using a pickup like that, um, you're always going to want to use more reverb than you think you need. That's kind of been my experience. And I do a, I do some test recordings a lot of time before I go live. Right. Uh, my recording software allows me or my streaming software allows me to just record as well rather than stream. Okay. So I'll usually do a couple test recordings because what you hear in your room coming out of the amp, it might sound a little wet. Like, hey, I'm in a well. Because you've got um, the reverb of the room going on. Out. I've yeah. also got the reverb of the room. So you know, I'm like, wow, this is like, it's got stuff dripping off of it. This is a little, <laughs> this is a little much, right? Yeah. Um, but then when you listen to the recording back, it's just right. You know, oh, okay. Well, because I'm only hearing the direct sound with a little verb on it, I'm not hearing the room that I'm in. So it's a thing to remember if you're recording direct, you're, you're going to need more reverb than you think. Yeah, it's interesting that because I'm rel I'm relatively new to trying to plug violins in and and you know playing with all this this stuff. It's a, they don't it's, cover any of that in music school. I don't. No, think. they don't. <laughs> definitely don't. So it's really interesting. But the fight, the thing I have found in the hardest of anything, is this difference between what you can hear here and what you hear. I mean, even if I've got my amp on and I'm trying to hear it, it's really really hard to hear it i think so yeah uh, headphones are a weird thing and it's it's the way here comes this engineering agree it's it's the way that human hearing works um so when you've got headphones on the way that we hear is from sound waves propagating through the air and so it requires us to have you know you can hear the difference blind people can tell and you can tell if you're paying attention if you walk through a doorway when you walk through a doorway, you can hear that. So sound engineers, I'm a sound engineer too. So we we sort of we sort of notice things other people hear. When you walk past the doorway, you actually hear the reverb change. And you can hear that, like you you'll hear a little dead spot go by where where that door is. So we are acutely aware of reverb, whether we know it or not. And when you put headphones on, it you don't have all this air moving in the room. And it, because these headphones deaden all that. Now they're great for isolation and they're great for certain things, but they really, they, you don't get the same, um, you don't get the same perception of space with this headphones on. This is true. It's really interesting. And it, and this is the big rabbit hole that I think you go down just trying to hear things and, you know. You, you might end up with a PhD in acoustics if you keep chasing this down. <laughs> yeah. That'd be good. That'd be fun. What would be your preference if you you say you've got your acoustic violin? Would you that video that I'm talking about? I think I preferred the sound where you just put a mic on. Actually, to the pick mm. the pickups change the sound more, don't they? It, well, a mic is always going to sound better than a pickup. There's no pickup that's ever going to sound better than a mic, um, unless we're talking about like some you know mic at, at the at the drive through at your fast food place. You know, <laughs> you know if you've got that kind of mic. <laughs> It's not hard to sound better, no. but a mic that costs more than $50, a pickup is never going to sound better than a mic. No. So the question is, why on earth would we put a pickup on a violin? And it's only in high volume settings where that's a thing, because if my engineer, and it's always back to the engineers, right? Um, it, if the engineer needs a more isolated signal in order to turn you up or turn you down without turning other things up and down, it's all about control. Um then a mic, if they've got you standing on stage next to a drummer, and I know when you're practicing in your room at night and there are people trying to sleep, 
that you think the violin is this ghastly loud instrument, <laughs> right? My God, this thing is, you know, <laughs> yeah, waking the dead with this yeah. instrument. <laughs> but compared to a 250 pound man sitting on a drum kit and every time he hits a cymbal, <laughs> his arms are coming up over his head. You got nothing. So if you're playing your violin next to a drummer and he's like a gorilla beating on this thing, <laughs> then you, any mic that's on your violin okay, is yeah, going to hear more yeah. cymbals than it hears violin. Sure. So the engineer is trying to turn the violin up and all he's getting is sounds like animal over there from the Muppets. Then, <laughs> then that's no good. No. So that's why we would go to a pickup. And that is because an isolated signal that's maybe not as pristine is better than a beautiful mic sound of a guy that we're trying not to listen to. <laughs> and also, I think you have more problems with feedback in a live situation with mics. You can have yeah, more course. problems with feedback with the with the uh, with your, the body of your violin and stuff. So right. uh, it's probably easier. So really, if you're at home, a mic's going to be a better route, probably. Yeah, I would never. Yeah. I would never plug in a pickup at home. Um, unless, gosh, to, you know, well, unless you want to put some, some effects on it and, and yeah. really even at, even then, um, if I'm doing it at home, a microphone, I can just record the clean, dry sound of my violin and I yeah. can put all those effects in, in post. Yeah. Now, if we move on to the electric, I, you've got this, I think it's about 20 minutes long guide to recording your electric violin you know mm. right from the start of that is just, i will put a link to that because that is just a really great oh, thank you video well it is great because you sort of talk about the difference between recording dry and wet and the signal chain and everything so um so yeah but because an electric violin is a different kind of thing i guess isn't it you're starting with it's, the pickup and so it's a whole just, different animal it's, yeah. it's sort of like in a i see you got an acoustic guitar there it's like the difference between an acoustic guitar and an electric guitar they're just different instruments they are the, they the are. technique is very similar uh, but they're different instruments for different applications. Yeah. And yeah. so it, it's always hard for me when people are like, well, I want an electric, but I want it to be just like my acoustic. I'm like, nobody ever says that about guitar. <laughs> nobody ever says, I want a Les Paul, but I want it to be just like my Martin no, acoustic. No, it's true. They are just complete. And I hadn't, I hadn't really, you know, I just thought, yeah, I fancy I, I bought my electric violin about 18 months ago. So it's sort of a new kind of thing to get oh, into. I love it. those bridge just, violins. They're so fantastic. They are. They are lovely. And I'm, I live pretty much up the road from bridge violins. So I went over there. To, yeah, made right there in the UK. Yeah, yeah. Just up the road. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Really, really nice. But yeah, like you say, it's a completely different. There's a different technique to playing it as well. Absolutely. Uh, definitely. Yeah, a little but, bit. Yeah. Uh, one of the big things that I find, the first thing that I find is with your um, with your acoustic you have to be the amplifier or you're you're the power behind the, the the acoustic violin is a mechanical amplifier but the power source is you right that thing is powered by by wheaties and cheerios <laughs> and peanut butter sandwiches so you have to put some beef into that your your right arm yeah, you know we got to put some heft on that to to get it out with the electric violin your power it's powered by coal or something or whatever whatever your electricity is made by um, so you can just, that right arm can be very light. And I find that when I try to coax the sound out of my electric, instead of beating the sound out of my electric, they're just so much sweeter and they, and they just speak so much clearer. So, uh, whenever I really don't play an acoustic, I don't ever perform on an acoustic. Uh, I practice a lot on my acoustic, but when I go to an acoustic, I play electric so much that I'm not used to laying my arm into that thing. And the tone is usually, it's not, it's, it's not very fat and thick. It's because I'm not, I'm not used to just laying into this instrument. Yeah, Everything is so yeah. light. Yeah, it's true. So that's it's one true. of the biggest differences. I think that the just left hand, right hand, we just, everything's got to be much, much lighter with the electric. Why you want to work that hard, man? That's why we got electricity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's cool, but it's um, it's a good journey to be going down. Yeah, definitely. And it's, I, I mean, I'm kind of interested in sort of getting different effects out of it and everything. So having electric to go you know, run through an effects thing and just play, you make sound that you can't Isn't make. That fun? It is good fun. It is good fun. I've been listening to a few of your tracks on Spotify today. 
Oh, um, okay. Really, wow. Yeah, you've got a lot of stuff on there, actually. I didn't realize. It's, uh, it's starting to how, populate out, yeah. Yeah, so, so uh, I shall definitely pu- be pointing people towards listening to uh, some of your output. It's excellent. Yeah, thank you. I, I released 12 tracks last year. I didn't, obviously, I didn't know that 2020 was going to be 2020. Who knew? I don't Who think knew? Anybody Who knew? knew. Um, and I had actually, I would toured with a band for 10 years and I left them in January of 2019 and spent 2019 writing and recording a violin centered rock album. Oh, okay. It's called One Way to Do It. And uh, so the idea was I'm going to write and release this seven song album, all original material. And then I'm going to put together a trio, sort of like a power trio, you know, Jimi Hendrix, bass, drums, guitar, but I'm going to yeah. be violin, drums, oh, cool. guitar. Yeah, yeah. Uh, violin, bass, and drums. Yeah, yeah. And then um, I'm going to tour it in 2020. We'll tour these songs and, yeah. and a couple of covers or whatever, but basically to prove to people that a power trio doesn't have to be guitar, bass, and drums. It can be violin, bass, and drums. That's why it I play could. a six string violin. It takes me all the way down to guitar range. Oh, wow. So then, so 2020 January, I released a song. It's a, a Zazappa remake that I had some brilliant players do um, some guest solos on. And so uh, I changed it from my guitar mo- wants to kill your mama to my fiddle wants to kill your mama. Okay. Right. Um, and then in my album from 2019, one of the best received songs was an instrumental, a rock instrumental. It was called uh, exile. Like, right. well, I'll, I'll write something that's similar to exile. So I've got another rock instrumental. So I wrote one called a Baga and that came out in February. And then March as things are starting to get weird I'm like, well, we're going to be shut down for a couple of weeks. Yeah. <laughs> and then we're going to be back at it. Right. And and I just played at NAM and I just played at ASTA and I have, I rewrote a Bach Partita. Bach Partita oh, number three. The yeah. da, 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 I love da, da, that. Is, yeah. It's in three. It's- well, I'm a rock guy. We don't like three. You can't, <laughs> you know, you can't waltz to that ain't rock and roll. So I rewrote the Bach Partita in four, added another beat to every measure and then right. had a buddy of mine put a hip hop beat to it. Okay, yeah. And that was kind of a big hit at NAM and it asked I was playing that and it was like, oh, that's cool because it's like Bach, but it's not Bach. Yeah. And it's got this it's, hip hop beat to it. So cool. So I was like, well, I should record that. And then so I've got three months, three tracks. It wasn't really I'm going to do one every month. I just had three <laughs> tracks in three months. Well, now we're locked down. And mm. I was like, well, I can't play out. So I might as well record. You know what? Let me just record a song every month. And that's so and that's that the finished that out the year. So, yeah, yeah. And as a songwriter, I'm inspired by events that are happening around me. And 2020 mm-hmm. certainly provided uh, this, inspiration the material there <laughs> or desperation or whatever. Especially um, over in the US. There's plenty oh of Oh, my goodness. <laughs> this place is a mess. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I ended up writing and recording a lot of original material, like in time as the year was going by. So some of the, you know, like June, there were a bunch of race riots and protests and stuff here. And I wrote some stuff that, that, you know, that really affected me. And so I wrote some of that stuff. Um, anyway, so all that to say that all that is finishing up and that's all going to be released as an album called window into wild, which is where I'm sort of, as the years going by, I'm writing about the things that are happening at the time. That's really cool. But yeah. I think, I think it transcends 2020 because 2020 was a microcosm of life in general, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot of sort of uncertainty in life anyway. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. But anyway, besides all this shameless self-promotion, one of the things that I wanted to do is each month kind of explore something with the violin that I had not explored previously. Interesting. Um, so the June tune is called Ruminations on June. Acoustic, it's actually recorded on a Viper, but it's a solo five string acoustic violin piece. Um, so it's it's basically like like a Bach partita, except it's not as well written as a Bach partita. Um <laughs> But it's, it's, yeah, solo violin. And I'd never really written anything for solo violin. And I'm like, well, I play an extended range. I don't want to write something for six because I do want other people to be able to play this if they're so inspired. And lots of people have fives. Not yeah, as many people true. yet. I'm working on not, this. But not oh, as many okay. people yet have six strings. <laughs> so I wanted to write something for five because I just don't think there's a huge body of work out there yet for five string violins. No, there isn't. No, no. So yeah. that's the thing that a lot of people ask. Actually, I work at Electric Violin Shop, if you hadn't mentioned that. Yeah. And um, one of the, th- we sell more five string violins than we sell four. Uh, it doesn't surprise me because when you, if you 
starting on that journey, the first thing you think is, hey, I can easily, I can, I can do extra strings now. Why not? Why not? Yeah. I mean, you I'm know? plugging the thing in. I'm already breaking rules. Let's break yeah, some more, yeah. let's, let's break some more it. rules let's while we're at it. Let's go for it. Six sounds a bit too far for me because I'm only, I, <laughs> I'm just getting used to, but then you go back on your acoustic and you think, oh, oh, it doesn't go down as far now. So oh yeah. Yeah. You really All the time those. I'll pick up a four and I'll start this, you know, I'm an improviser. So I'll start this run and, and as I'm coming down finishes. the G string, the G string, I'm thinking, oh no, there's nowhere else to go. So now I got to turn this thing around and come back. Uh, but the thing is, you, there are tighter string spacings. The angles are a little tighter with a five than they are with a four. That's true. Yeah. I, that's, so that's, yeah. You go back to a four and it feels like, oh my God, you could drive a truck between these strings. Like, <laughs> I know, you have to, that's how could you, you ever play. accidentally hit a string? My God, they're a mile apart. Yeah. Yeah. It's or a true. kilometer. I don't know. You yeah, guys use yeah, kilometers. <laughs> Yeah, so are they, are they even tighter on a six string then? They must, or yeah, a little bit. Um, I have really big hands too, so I, my neck on my six string is is pretty big. So I like that wider spacing. Right. Um, so in my case, I'm like, let's just put a plank up here, and uh, it's fine. It's, you know, whatever. <laughs> Oh, that's brilliant. Uh, yeah, it's really. Yeah. Anyway, it's been really good to talk to you. I shall definitely put links to. The massive content that already exists and keeps streaming out every week. I mean, even you, like you were saying that this week before you came away, you had to kind of like get some content ready for the, you're not there. It doesn't stop. Doesn't stop. Yeah. So the content creation thing is, is uh, what it started that I started working at electric violin shop and we, I find myself answering the same questions from people all the time on email. I was like, I really should. It, and it's because I'm lazy. I really should just put a video together. Yeah. And then every time I get this question, I'm like, control V, control V. I'm just sending you, I'm copy and paste. I'm just going to send you this video. I do quite a bit um, of that. <laughs> and then it was like, well, the thing is music is a thing that has to be heard. We can talk about music. My friend Tripp has an album called Dancing About Architecture, basing, based on that, on the, uh, on the quote that, you know, talking about music is like dancing about architecture. It doesn't, it doesn't translate. We, we don't have enough words for this. So the best thing for me to do is just show you. Yeah. Yeah. So we do a video and I can just show you what I'm talking yeah, about because yeah, I can't put it yeah. into words. Oh, and you can hear it. You know, you can hear what you mean then. Yeah. And that's the thing, yeah. like your ears aren't the same as mine. So no. people ask, well, what's the best pickup? I'm like, I don't know. It's like, what, what's the How best How do you play? Pickup? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I can tell you what I like, but that doesn't, that doesn't tell you what you like. Yeah. No. So why don't I just play all five of them and you decide what you like best? I mean, if you really want to know, I'll tell you what I like, but I'm a weirdo. So you may not want to, <laughs> you may not pick the same thing I pick. So if I just play all five of these and you can go, yeah, I like the second one better. Well, then buy the second one because that's the one that speaks to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a bit like choosing a violin. I mean, you know, one person's best violin is somebody else's, you know, don't like that much, you know. So and that's uh, why they make a bunch of different ones. Well, they you do, know, if, yes. If there was one true. best one, everybody, everybody would try to make it. their violin exactly like that. Yeah, that's been brilliant. Now you do one-to-one lessons, don't you? In I do. playing and also in helping people set up and so on, I guess, and all, all things, mostly electric, electric violin, mostly. Yeah, or? mostly electric violin. And I don't take beginning students. Um, no. I'm not going to teach you how to play. No. Um, I might teach you what to play. Um, I'm an improviser and I, I have a method for teaching improvisation that starts with uh, the Nashville number system. And, yeah. and it's where we, we number things by scale degree. So, right, yeah. um, and that's, yeah. that's what, just the way improvisers talk. We talk about with well, the three of the five chord or, or the six of the two chord. So we're talking, and once you understand that language, then all of this improvisation mathematically, there's the engineering degree, it all starts to make sense. And then it translates like I can, the concepts that I learned in the key of A translate to the key of D flat and yeah. then translate to the key of F. And all this starts to make sense. You go, oh, so I've got a method of teaching improvisation okay, that I right. think is helpful, especially for people that are more sort of mathematically minded. So I teach improv and I teach a lot of times people say, okay, I know how to improv. I know how to play by ear. But when I get on stage, I don't know like what to play. So I'll teach a lot of like how, what the decision-making process is on stage. Right. You know, how would I decide, am I going to play a run here? Am I going to play a whole note here? Um, am I not going to play at all? Cause that actually is an option. Most violinists would, would eschew, um, <laughs> but it's a great option and it pays yeah. the same as playing 16th notes and it will probably <laughs> get you the call back first. Um, you know, this right here is a completely legal move with the, with the bow. 
Um, and then I also teach the electronic side of things. You know, if you're getting into your DAWs, if you get into logic, how do I make my violin sound thicker in logic? And, you know, how do I get my mic placement in my room better? And how do I get a distortion sound that doesn't sound like angry bees? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's so a good all question. Of that, all that kind of stuff. Yep. Really good questions. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, I'll put a link because, yeah, sounds good. Yes, sounds please. Really thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for talking to me. That's been absolutely brilliant. Uh, yeah, likewise. Excellent. Yeah, thanks for calling. Yeah. This has been a lot of fun. No, it has. It has. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your skiing vacation. I'm trying, you know, the thing is usually when a musician heads out of town, everybody's like, break a leg. And uh, this trip, they're like, don't break a leg. <laughs> don't break a leg. <laughs> no, don't break a leg. No, we need you back next week doing more stuff. <laughs> hey, I, I don't need to be sitting in a wheelchair doing this stuff. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thanks. Very All right. Thank you. That was so interesting and a lot of fun too. As always, do post any comments or questions below. I love to read them. As you saw, Matt Bell is a really cool guy. If you want to see more of his videos and other stuff, then do subscribe to the Electric Violin Shop channel or check out all the links I've put in the description below to his website and other cool stuff. And if you want more of my home recording tips and tricks, then do subscribe to Music Repo. If you've enjoyed this, Give it a like. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye for now.